Welcome, my name is Joan Houston and I'm a member of the FRAC Sustainability Reporting Tech. Today, I'm pleased to provide a quick introduction to ESRSS2 on workers and the value chain, ESRSS3 on affected communities, and ESRSS4 on consumers and end users. Let me start with some background information. Based on the EU Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, companies are to report on impacts connected with their activities, including the value chain, through alignment with internationally recognised frameworks. It also includes a mandate to develop standards on social factors and human rights, covering equal treatment and opportunities for all, working conditions and the respect for the human rights, fundamental freedoms, democratic principles and standards established in international instruments. And this is precisely what S2, S3 and S4 are based on. The next slide provides a snapshot of the structure of the ESRS social pillar. You can see a total of four subtopics in the social area. These are own workforce, which however is dealt with in a separate presentation, followed by workers in the value chain, affected communities and consumers and end users. Within each of these three standards, there's an indication of relevant sub subtopics, as well as related issues which undertakings should take into account in their materiality assessment. Should companies identify any of these issues as material, these should then be reported following the disclosure framework provided by ESRS S2, S3 and S4. This brings me to the content of the standards themselves. While well, of course each standard includes its own specificities and focuses on a different stakeholder group, the structure of these standards is aligned. Each provides two complementary requirements and strategy connected to ESRS 2, and these include specifications in relation to interests and views of stakeholders in connection to the undertaking's business model and strategy, as well as specifications related to impacts, risks and opportunities and their interaction with the entity's business model and strategy. There's an additional five disclosure requirements on implementation. These can be divided into two categories. Four disclosure requirements on impact, risk and opportunity management on the one hand, and one on metrics and targets on the other. Disclosure requirement one requires information on the policies adopted in relation to the relevant affected stakeholder group. Disclosure requirement two is on the processes in place to engage affected stakeholders about impacts on them as part of companies' ongoing due diligence process. Disclosure requirement three is on processes to remediate negative impacts on value chain workers, affected communities and consumers and end users, as well as channels to raise concerns. Disclosure requirement four is on taking action on impacts and effectiveness of those actions, as well as approaches to mitigating material risks and pursuing material opportunities. And lastly, disclosure requirement five is on targets in relation to negative and positive impacts, as well as risks and opportunities. I'd like to highlight that S2, S3 and S4 apply to impacts, risks and opportunities identified by undertakings themselves through their own materiality assessment. There is an exception. There's a number of data points that have been included for alignment with existing EU legislation, such as the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. These are mandatory, independent of the materiality assessment of the company. So with this, I've concluded this quick overview and introduction to S2, S3 and S4, which I hope you found helpful. For further details, please refer to the draft ESRSs uploaded on the EFRAG website. Thank you.